Our argument is that the path to peace requires nothing less, and I know it's a tall order, than the transformation of what it means to be a Palestinian. Welcome to Global Perspectives. It's my pleasure to bring to you Dr. Anat Wilf, a woman who is Harvard educated, served as an advisor to Israel's iconic former president, Shimon Peres, as well as serving in Israel's parliament, the Knesset. Dr. Anat Wilf has been one of the most prolific writers and speakers on subjects ranging from Zionism to what is upholding the peace process today. Anat Wilf. Thank you so much for joining me on Global Perspectives. It's really wonderful to have you with us. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. Anat, you've written extensively, and I would say eloquently, making the case for the Jewish state of Israel and for Zionism. As you um, take a look at the landscape in the Western world today, are you optimistic that the West really has a positive relationship with Israel today? No, and I think I'm more worried about what it means for the West than what it means for Israel. Uh, I think for a very long time, there was a mistaken view in the West, in the United States especially, that the rising virulent anti-Zionism has anything to do with Israel. So I think there was a notion that somehow if you have rising anti-Zionism, Israel had done something wrong. Uh, so maybe Israel did something wrong yesterday, or it's because it's Benjamin Netanyahu, or there was a whole series of kind of things and hooks to hook up on and say, okay, this is why it's rising. I think now, only now, there's the beginning of an understanding that the rising anti-Zionism in the West is really not about Israel. It's basically an assault on Jewish life in the West. It is the new, respectable, shiny form of an assault on Jews, one that has enjoys uh, intellectual responsibility, uh, intellectual respectability. And I think now Jews in the West are beginning to wake up to the fact that the rising anti-Zionism is about a crisis of the West manifesting itself in an assault on Jewish life in the West and actually very little to do with Israel. You know, I couldn't agree with you more. And in, in my uh, term in office as the deputy envoy to combat anti-Semitism for the Trump administration, our administration's policy is that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And, uh, and I think that we are seeing this unfortunate um, excuse making in the West where uh, there is this attempt to say uh, and almost mimicking old Soviet anti-Semitism and, and the Iranian regime's propaganda. We don't have any problem with the Jews. It's the Jewish state of Israel that we take issue with. Anat, since you have uh, been fighting this battle for quite some time, what do you think it's going to take for people in the West to understand exactly what you said, which is that this is kind of like the latest form of anti-Semitism. It's given cover in academia and intellectual circles. Uh, unfortunately, the only way that really ultimately people understand is that when it begins to hit home, uh, because, you know, you could have the intellectual debates and I participated in them and I've just been teaching a course at Georgetown here on Zionism and anti-Zionism. And you can engage in all the intellectual debates about why anti-Zionism does not have to be, uh, anti-Semitism. And of course, Intellectually, you can make the case. The problem is that empirically, any society, organization, party, university campus that have turned virulently anti-Zionist, within a short time, they basically saw no Jews. So this is the case, of course, with the Arab world when it turned anti-Zionist. This is the case with uh, the British Labor Party under Corbyn. And you're seeing it, for example, in American campuses now. So American campuses that have turned virulently anti-Zionist have also become inhospitable to Jews. And then what you're saying, for example, is parents suddenly realizing 
that anti-Zionism is not some far away issue that is of no concern to them because their children are beginning to consider college campuses based on whether those campuses have an atmosphere that is conducive to a thriving Jewish life. And most young people, I think, correctly understand that a virulently anti-Zionist campus is one in which they will not be able to just devote themselves to their studies at peace. They will be forced to uh, either declare their allegiance to anti-Zionist causes or be uh, excommunicated if they dare imply that they are favorable towards the state of Israel. So I think there's an understanding that this hits home. And the more you see people seeing that it hits home, then the understanding emerges. Well, first of all, um, I think that this correlation that you're describing is uh, exactly right, that uh, that this anti-Zionism, certainly on college campuses, creates a hostile environment, and it does become impossible for Jewish students to really thrive in those kind of atmospheres. And so much of that is about the Palestinian narrative. So I would love to pivot right now to your latest book, uh, which I read from cover to cover and uh, thought was really one of the most important works we have out there about uh, not only Israeli history, but the issues of making peace. The book is The War of Return, How Western Indulgence of the Palestinian Dream Has Obstructed the Path to Peace. And in your introduction with your co-author, um, Adi Schwartz, I should mention, in your introduction, you state that both you and Adi are people who come from the left in Israel, and you were um, baffled to see that with effort after effort to make peace with the Israelis, efforts to make peace with the Palestinians, there was no success. Aina, tell us the central thesis of your book. So the central thesis of our book is that the core of the conflict is and has always been uh, the Arab and especially Palestinian rejection, blanket rejection of the right of the Jewish people to self-determination in any territory and in any border whatsoever. Uh, to the credit of the Palestinians, they have made it consistently clear over the decades uh, the fact that the Palestinians are still committed to this idea is best understood by delving through to this notion of the so-called right of return, which in the book we show is not a right and it's not a return by now. But from the Palestinian perspective, it is their belief that millions of Palestinians possess a sacred right that is more uh, the tops Israeli sovereignty and that they possess the right to settle within Israel in breach of Israeli sovereignty. Now, such a right does not exist, but they believe it does and they are deeply committed to it. And for them, what we show is that this is the top priority. For the Palestinians, much more important than having a state for themselves in part of the land has always been a greater priority to ensure that the Jewish people do not have a state in any other part of the land. Uh, and this has been their consistent behavior for decades, basically for nearly a century. And I want to I want to yeah. jump in because because there's a lot that you mentioned right now, and I want to I want to unpack it with you a, a little bit. So um, in your book, what you've done with Adi Schwartz is that you have documented in detail what happens with uh, the 1948 war where Israel is under attack. Um, what we find is that either there are Palestinians who flee their villages and homes, or in some cases they are forced to flee by Israelis because it is a time of war. And, and again, you document all of this very carefully about, about kind of some of the gruesome attacks that the Palestinians are conducting on Israelis at the time. And Again, it's a time of war, and so you've got the creation of refugees, and so there's 700,000 refugees, Palestinian refugees, uh, following the 1948 war. What happens after that is that the United Nations takes these extraordinary measures that they apparently don't take for any other population. So could you tell us a little bit about the UN's role in 1948 and how they have exasperated the Palestinian refugee issue to this day? Certainly. Certainly. 
One of the things we show in the book is that there's nothing special about refugees being created in the course of war. Certainly throughout the 20th century, empires disappear, new states come to replace them. There's a lot of wars about borders. In many ways, you could argue the two world wars were part of this transition. So there's nothing special about Arab refugees being created as a result of war. Um, What is special is that unlike all other refugees throughout the 20th century, tens of millions of refugees, they are allowed to continue to maintain themselves as perpetual refugees as if the war was never over. All other refugees received the harsh but important message, which is it's tough and it's tragic, but move on. We expect you to move on with your life and you don't look back. The Palestinians were indulged through an organization called the UN Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, which was established as a temporary agency to settle the Arab refugees from the war. In the book, we tell of a similar temporary agency called Ankara for the Korean refugees that settled three times the number, so two million Korean refugees, in a few short years with a quarter of the budget of UNRWA, And look at where South Korea is today, because they got the memo that you move on and you settle and you build a new life. The Arab refugees were allowed to maintain themselves in this perpetual limbo. And UNRWA, it's still a temporary organization after 70 years. UNRWA was allowed to continue to the present day to keep alive generation after generation for the Palestinians and the Palestinians only, the idea that the war of 1948 is not over and that they will one day be able to undo the consequences of that war in the form of the establishment of the state of Israel. And as a result, of course, we're still stuck in conflict. And and so in the book, you know, you document how you go from 700,000 Palestinian refugees to, to what they claim is five, five, a little bit over 5 million uh, Palestinian refugees today. At the same time, of course, we saw um, the transfer of Jews from the Middle East, North Africa region, people who were forced out of our homes in that region, um, get resettled into Israel. So, so again, one of the things that you highlight in the book is that all across the world, there are these refugee populations. When the countries, the home countries, want to take them back out of their free will, they get resettled. Or in the case of Israel, Israel takes all these Jews from the Middle East, North Africa. But the Palestinians are never settled in any Arab country that they're living in. And even in Gaza, they live in these refugee camps so that they are never settled anywhere in any society, never given citizenship. And UNRWA is facilitating the uh, this this never ending crisis in effect. Exactly. And uh, what we show in the book is that the refugee situation is actually absurd. It's an entire farce that's being maintained by UNRWA. The Palestinians today, the 5.7 million who are uh, registered by UNRWA as refugees. Almost none of them are refugees by any international measures. About 40% of them, over 2 million, live in the West Bank and Gaza. Whatever your politics are, they are living in Palestine. They are settled in Palestine. They were born there. They were never displaced by war. They don't need to be resettled. They are not refugees. Another 2.2 million are citizens of Jordan. Jordan was actually a country that was willing to accept and naturalize the Arab refugees and end the war with Israel. But of course, a Palestinian extremist assassinated King Abdullah because of that. And ever since, Jordan's kind of iffy. But again, they're citizens. They've been born in Jordan. They've never been displaced by war. Nowhere in the world is someone a citizen and a refugee. So they're not refugees either. And another million who are registered in Lebanon and Syria, we know from data that most of them have left. Uh, My favorite refugee on the books of honor in Syria is the multimillionaire playboy father of supermodels Gigi and Bella Hadid. He's an American citizen. He's not a refugee, but he's still on Onra's books in Syria because he was born there. So the number of Actual Palestinians who are in need of care and resettlements is about 200 
300,000. Those are small numbers that the real UN Agency for Refugees, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, knows to settle within a five to 10 year period. So the actual Palestinian refugee issue is minor. It's not a big deal. The problem is that it is a huge issue in their mindset. To be a Palestinian in many ways is to be a refugee is to be a refugee and to believe in this right of return and to devote your entire resources to this idea and to never move on, to never build a constructive goal, but always focus on destroying the Jewish state rather than building a state for yourself. And so in in the book, you document um, statements that various members of the Palestinian leadership over the years have made to the effect, so whether it was Yasser Arafat through the Oslo process, Sayyab Arakat and others, where they make these statements to the effect of, you know, I can I can agree to these peace deals, but there's no way I can ever tell a Palestinian that they can't return to their homes and when they say their homes, they're talking about homes in in central Israel, you know, in Yafo, in Tel Aviv, and elsewhere. So in essence, what you and Adi Schwartz point out in your book is that um, this uh, Palestinian intransigence is, is all about never accepting a Jewish state of Israel in the Middle East. So uh, never is a big word. And in many ways, I call myself now a long term peacemaker, because what we show in the book is that the leaders are actually the hostages of their people. Uh, Typically, we have this notion that somehow the Palestinian leadership is extreme and the people would like nothing less than just to make peace with Israel based on a two state solution. What we show throughout the book is that it's the people themselves who are extreme, who refuse to accept the idea of a Jewish state in any borders. And the UNRWA schools only exacerbate this kind of national consciousness focused on revenge and return. And as a result, the Palestinian leaders, even if they themselves might be a little more moderate, like Abu Mazen, they know that at the end of the day, they are hostages to a population that holds the idea of the right of return above all else. So our argument for peace is not to go find a new leader. The leaders of the Palestinians will always be hostages to this idea as long as this is the essence of the Palestinian identity. Our argument is that the path to peace requires nothing less, and I know it's a tall order, than the transformation of what it means to be a Palestinian. Well, let's well let's talk about that because Anad, in your book, you, you're describing a vicious cycle, which is that the uh, the school system run by UNRWA is indoctrinating generation after generation of Palestinians to, in fact, never accept Israel. They don't show Israel on the maps. They're indoctrinating the children in many different ways to the point where in the in the 80s and 70s, if I've got my timeline straight. The refugee, the UNRWA-run camps are actually terrorist breeding grounds where you're getting terrorist leadership coming out of these camps. Certainly. One of the biggest revelations we had in the book is to realize the critical role of the UNRWA schools in forging a Palestinian national consciousness. Now, that in itself is no big deal. A lot of national uh, identities are fairly young and have been developed in the second half of the 20th century. So that's not a problem in itself. The problem is that the national Palestinian consciousness that emerges and gets consolidated in the UNRWA schools is one that is singularly focused on return and revenge. As a result, the, and we tell the story, for example, of the Munich massacre, uh, the people who committed it were children of the refugee camps. They went through the UNRWA schools and they grew up to believe that they have no higher calling than destroying the state of Israel and that therefore all means are justified, including slaughtering athletes in an Olympic. There is a direct relationship between creating a Palestinian national consciousness that is focused on revenge and return and uh, the choosing of the means of terrorism. 
which is why, again, we need to, in many ways, the entire Palestinian national identity needs to be rewired away from this idea that to be a Palestinian is to destroy Israel and to be a refugee and to have return towards a vision that says we want to build a state next to Israel rather than instead of it. Well, and, and you know, that that's unfortunately, it's a vision I'm not sure that anybody in the Palestinian leadership holds. But but I want to I want to just talk a little bit more about UNRWA before we move on. Um, the Trump administration, as you point out in your book, did choose to defund UNRWA. Now, you take issue with the way that the Trump administration did. Um, tell us what you think would be the most effective way for the United States and for the West to deal with this U.N. agency. So uh, we were very impressed when uh, President Trump decided to defund UNRWA because, as we argue in the book, there's no reforming that organization. This is an organization devoted to keeping the War of 1948 alive. There's no reform that would make it better. It has to end. And the only way to close down UNRWA is to basically deprive it of the funding that it gets from the West more than a billion dollars on a regular basis. And it's important to emphasize UNRWA is not a humanitarian organization. It's a political organization that provides the non-emergency ongoing schooling and health care services of the Palestinians. Now, what we wanted the Trump administration to do, which would have been effective, is to not leave it at that. They basically defunded UNRWA, issued a statement, and did nothing else. What they should have done is to approach all the other countries that fund UNRWA and tell them, look, we want this organization closed down and we need you to pull out as well. Instead, it became a burden sharing issue of like, okay, the U.S. is getting out, but other countries are picking up the slack. And of course, as soon as there's a new administration, uh, the Biden administration just refunded UNRWA because it wasn't a sustainable process. So what we well, I just I just want to say in in my administration's defense, um, there's no other administration that supported Israel like President Trump and Ambassador Nikki Haley and. Uh, and uh, our ambassador who came in after that did um, in terms of, of UN voting and defunding UNRWA and pointing out the systemic um, bias against Israel that we see in the UN. I, I hear what you're saying, Anad, and I think that uh, we can be hopeful that maybe a, a future Republican administration might, might take this advice. It is a huge project in and itself, I think, to try to convince the Europeans and others to defund UNRWA as well. But in, in your book, um, you lay out a plan for what you just mentioned, which is the vision for the Palestinians to actually be able to live in coexistence and side by side with Israel as a Jewish state and their neighbor next to them. So please, if you could expand on that, what are order? I believe there's five points that you have for what needs to happen in order for a true peace to be facilitated. So given that for there to be peace, the very Palestinian national consciousness has to change, this is not going to happen without serious pressure. Only then will they go through this process of reckoning. What we recommend are elements of policy and element of messages. The messages require saying some very harsh messages that I know not everyone likes to give, but if you want to do good, you sometimes have to stop wanting to feel good. I find that too many people want to feel good, but it does nothing to do good. What are those harsh messages? They need to tell the Palestinians, you're not refugees. The war of 1948 is long over. In that war, given that your goal in that war was to prevent the establishment of the state of Israel for the Jewish people, you were defeated. You have to therefore move on with your lives and Build your lives wherever you are. You do not possess a right of return into the state of Israel. So we're not even asking you to give up that right because you don't possess it to begin with. Those are some of the messages that need to be constantly uh, placed. Policy-wise, those messages need to be underwritten by basically uh, closing down UNRWA because UNRWA is viewed by the Palestinians, and I believe correctly, as the symbol that the West legitimizes their idea of a right of return. 
Now, the West should stop being blind to that and close down UNRWA in order to send the message to the Palestinians that there is zero legitimacy for the idea that they can undo Israel. Uh, those are the messages. Those are the policies. And our argument is that nothing less will do because the conflict is so deep, because it is about an entire people refusing to recognize the right of another people to share the land with them, uh, the entire people have to go through a painful and long process of recreating who they are and rechanging their goals. Hey, you know, it, it sounds, uh, it sounds spot on. I, there's no other way to achieve peace, I think, other than for the Palestinians to really imagine themselves as peace partners for the Israelis. My last question for you is this. Who do you think is going to be delivering these tough messages and who do you think will help the Palestinians kind of hold their hands through this process that, that I do believe they need to go through as a people? Do you think that the Israeli government, your current coalition, has the political will to do this while also at the same time facing the Iranian threat? Do you think the Biden administration with all of their different leanings is going to be doing that? Do you imagine the Europeans are there? I'm curious who you think can can actually implement what I think are very wise uh, suggestions in your book. Ironically, my greatest hope these days is from the Arab world. Uh, because uh, the changes in the Arab world, the normalization, the greater acceptance in Israel, the thing is that the Arab world knows what the conflict is about. They know that it's never been about the settlements or the occupation or not even Jerusalem. They know that the conflict has always been about their refusal to accept a Jewish state in any borders. So they're in the best position to tell Palestinians it's over. Enough is enough. We are no longer interested in committing our peoples and resources to the battle against Israel and Zionism. This is me this message is beginning to come out of the Gulf. You heard the Gulf states saying some pretty harsh things to the Palestinians. Uh, so ironically, I think they're the ones that might be the best carriers of this message because they know what the conflict is really about. My only concern, and this brings us to the beginning of our interview, is that Western anti-Zionists will rush to fill the void uh, and basically tell the Palestinians, oh no, you know, don't listen to that. Keep fighting. It's about rights. It's about justice. And, the, and if they do that, they will only extend the conflict further. Well, I think that's a really powerful message, uh, for us to end on. The, the notion and, and, you know, what an incredible world we live in. I, I would say that, uh, we're really privileged to live in this time post the Abraham Accords where we are seeing an incredible seismic shift in the Middle East, North Africa, where as you just pointed out, it is the Arab states who are being the most realistic and helping the Palestinian people understand what they need to do to live in peace and really give a future to their children and grandchildren. And the irony that the outsiders from the West could be creating the biggest obstacle to peace. Well, Anat Wilf, I can't thank you enough for joining me on Global Perspectives. I hope that your message gets out there. Thank you again for joining me. Thank you so much, Ellie. Thank you. Peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Ultimately, it will take a vision of coexistence for all parties to get there. I would argue too that the Palestinian people really need to be willing to accept a Jewish state and a Jewish presence, the Jewish people's right to live in the Middle East, North Africa, a people who have been there for thousands of years and who are here to stay. Thanks so much for joining me on Global Perspectives. Join me the next time.